Thanks so much to Teresa Malinowski Rakowski. Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> for inviting me, and thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, mostly about Kitty Cornered today, um, but I'll also talk a little bit about uh, my other couple books just to give you some background. And um, my first book was called Enslaved by Ducks, and my cat book could have easily been called Outsmarted by Cats, because that's really what it's about. But um, I guess Kitty Cornered is probably a uh, better title. Um, but I have uh, kind of decided that cats are at the absolute top of the evolutionary chain, and that if there's any such thing as reincarnation, I want to come back not just as a cat, but I want to come back as one of our cats, if that's possible. <laughs> Uh, as I was uh, putting the stories together for Kitty Cornered, I started wondering while you know, reviewing the stories, is it possible that my wife Linda and me are dumber than most cat owners? Or perhaps could it be that our cats are smarter than most cats? And I don't think that either of those things are actually true. I think cats are just experts at getting their own way. So. I'm going to um, talk, uh, tell you a couple of the stories uh, that are in the book, do, um, do a couple short readings. I always like to tell people how long the readings that I'm going to do are. And the readings I'm going to do are probably about four minutes, maybe a little longer than that. The reason I'm telling you that is a few years ago, I was up at a library in Luther. And I was reading the section from Enslaved by Ducks that I always read, and it was about 13 minutes long. And I was just on the last page of the reading, and a woman in the audience said, is he going to read the whole book? <laughs> so from then on, I always tell people how long it's going to be so that you can set your watch and start counting down. So no, I'm not going to read the whole book tonight. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, in, in Slave by Ducks was my first book. And I was not an animal person when I married my wife, Linda, in 1990. I must have had it in me, but I certainly wasn't, because uh, we had had a beagle when I was growing up, and that was about it. But Linda was a animal person, and she was also a genius at getting animals into our house. Mm -hmm. So for our first wedding anniversary, she gave me, as a present, a pet dove named Howard. And I have to tell you that 22 years later, we still have Howard. He is one of the few uh, animals in Enslaved by Ducks that we still have. And then uh, she gave me, for my birthday, a canary named Chester. And it, uh, our first cat, Penny, came at Christmas. And it wasn't long before the ducks and other animals came. But it also wasn't long before Linda no longer had to be the person who was kind of sneaking the animals in because I discovered after a couple of years that I had a soft spot for animals too and before long I was the person who was kind of suggesting that we get animals. So when I wrote Enslaved by Ducks, we had I think about two dozen animals at that time and it sounds a little worse than it really is because a lot of the animals were outdoor animals, the ducks, the geese, and at that time also for turkeys. So Enslaved by Ducks is really a story that takes place from about 1990 to 2000 about how in 10 years time I went from living a blissful, quiet life out in the country to living a life of being uh, constantly pestered by uh, two dozen animals. After that came a second book, Fall Weather. And Fall Weather was basically a sequel to Enslaved by Ducks a little more serious. Uh, I talk about my mom who had Alzheimer's and her problems with that and my dad passing away and then a lot more uh, about the animals. And that took place from about 2000 to 2005 and then Kitty Cornered is pretty much 2005-ish to about uh, 2009. When I started writing Kitty Cornered, um, we had 53 animals. That was a, a high, a high point. And, um, 
again, most of them were uh, outdoor animals, and we do not have that many now. So we have, uh, as, uh, Teresa was mentioning at, at the beginning, uh, out, right now we have uh, four cats. Uh, two of the cats that were in Kitty Cornered uh, passed away from basically old age. We have two African gray parrots that drive us absolutely nuts. Uh, they're worse than all the other animals combined. We have uh, two ring-necked doves. We have Howard and we have another one and we have um, uh, and a blue jay we're not really supposed to have. So um, you'll have to edit the tape and take that part out. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, we're, uh, my wife does wildlife rehab work uh, in the summer for um, Wildlife Rehab Center in Grand Rapids, and she raises and releases orphan songbirds, and those find their way into my books too. And in fact, the next book that I'm just starting to work on now is about birding and wild birds. So that's, that's kind of the background to everything. Now, Enslaved by Ducks, in the beginning, has, if I can find it, a pretty impressively long cast of characters. I like to say that it, just in terms of the characters, it's kind of war and peace with feathers. Um, Kitty Cornered does not have a cast of characters. Kitty Cornered, more appropriately, has a cat of characters. And I list the names of the six cats, their nicknames, and a description of them. Now, you may ask, why didn't I put pictures of the cats in my book, and that's usually what people ask me, and it's because it wasn't up to me, and the publisher decided not to do that. But the good news is if you go to my website, bobtart.com, you will find many photos of the cats, and I'm going to show you photos of the cats in, in just a second. Uh, one other thing I wanna show you is in the front of the book, is a diagram called Ground Floor of a House Overrun by Cats. And I got the idea for doing kind of a map because I like reading mysteries. And there's a lot of mysteries where there's a map in the beginning of the book showing the scene of the crime. And in Kitty Corner, there are many crimes committed by kitties against us. So I thought I should put those in there. And so there are uh, letters uh, indicating certain things that happened, like the clawed wallpaper in the bathroom and um, showing where that happened and keyed to the, the book. Okay. So I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do, and I don't think this is gonna show up in your video too well, but I'm going to show you pictures of the six cats in Kitty Cornered and tell you a little bit about them. Uh, and then I'm going to do, um, as I say, a couple of readings. And one reading is gonna be about my first cat, Franny. And uh, then I'm going to tell a couple stories about cats outsmarting us, since that's really what uh, Kitty Cornered is all about. And um, then I'd like to hear about your cats or your animals. So this is Franny. Oh. And Franny uh, is a very, very skittish stray cat. And uh, I'll tell you more about her in a while. But um, one thing I used to call her in the beginning, especially when I first saw her from the window, was Alfie Girl or Alfalfa because of I don't know if any of you folks remember the uh, Our Gang comedy or the Little Rascals, but there was a character called Alfalfa, and I think his hair was parted like that, if I'm not mistaken. So that was Franny. And Franny was um, so skittish in the early days that we don't get a lot of stray cats, even though we're out in the country and we have a big red barn, which is usually a sign for people to just dump cats. When we do get them, usually uh, they'll kind of amble into the yard I'll go out and give them food and they'll kind of um, move back while I'm putting the food out and then sometimes still come up for the food or at least when I come inside, come for the food. Franny was different. Franny was so shy that if she just saw my face in the window, she bolted. And she didn't just withdraw, she ran all the way to the river. And we knew that because she came in the absolute dead of winter and there were no leaves on the trees and we, we could see where she went. So I know I'm not the uh, most attractive person in the world, but I usually don't make people run in. Right. <laughs> and here's a, this is, uh, Franny is not an outdoor cat anymore. None of our cats are outdoor cats. But this is Franny when she was queen of the world. Outdoor cat. Uh, this is Agnes. And I just pushed a button, and so we'll go back to photos. This is Agnes. 
And Agnes is our oldest cat, she's 19, and she is still uh, chasing any of the cats that dare to come upstairs and get too close to her. She spends most of her time sleeping on my uh, computer chair and takes great offense when I try to even occupy the last three inches of it to do any work at all. <laughs> Uh, Agnes was the only other cat we have that came to us as a stray. All our cats were rescues, but she was a stray. And she came to us on New Year's in uh, 1994, I believe. And she was, let's see if that math works out, I'm not sure, I think so, yeah. And she was so hungry that she was eating um, black oil sunflower seed that spilled from the feeder. So, but she was not shy, she climbed right up me and jumped into my arms, so she was pretty friendly. And there she is doing her Halloween kitty impersonation. <laughs> Here we have Mooby. Mooby uh, came to us as Moonbeam, and I just could not bring myself to call Moonbeam. <laughs> and so I shortened it really quickly to Mooby, and Linda thought that was an excellent idea too. I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but she has um, one blue eye and one green eye. And so, She's a very sweet kitty. Hello. Hi. This is Maynard. And Maynard was uh, one of our uh, later additions. And uh, Maynard is the big baby of the house. And Maynard's favorite pastime, he does this every day more than once a day, he likes to exile himself to the furthest room in our house from where we are and then start whining that he's been exiled to the furthest room of the house away from us. So, um, and you can see what a really hard and sad life Maynard has. It's just <laughs> very pathetic. Um, took, last time I took Maynard to the vet, he weighed in at 20.2 pounds. Mm -hmm. So he's a lot of cat and uh, he's my napping companion. So he has a warm place in my heart for that. This is Tina. Now, I've been asked before if the kitty on Kitty Cornered is one of our cats. And the answer to that is no, this is a cat supermodel. The, my uh, publisher uh, hired her just for the cover. But what I like about this cover a lot, aside from the fact that people can see it from across the bookstore and then buy it, I hope, is the fact that the stare is exactly the stare that Tina has. I've tried to get a picture of Tina with that stare, but I've been unable to. We call it the high beam stare, and it's really quite intimidating when she locks that onto me. Excuse me. Tina came to us from uh, Linda's minister, and um, the minister's daughter-in-law was fostering Tina. Tina was a young mother and he had to run some errands in town in Lowell. And so he asked if they could keep Tina and her babies in a crate on our porch for an hour or a couple hours. And that was just deadly because uh, Linda immediately fell in love with Tina. And this was shortly after we had Maynard. And Linda said, you know, this cat is so sweet. She is uh, so sedate. Can't we please have one normal cat? So we decided that yes, we would adopt Tina. We didn't realize that the reason she was so sedate was because she was a nursing mother. Once the babies were separated from her and Tina came to live with us, she was a little terror. And she's outgrown that and she's a sweet cat, but um, there's stories about Tina and Kitty Cornered. And the last cat I'm showing you is Lucy. And Lucy was the curmudgeon of the house. Uh, we called her a, a snapping crocodile disguised as a cat. Um, I worked with, uh, Lucy came from a friend of mine at work. He used to work with me, his name was Dave. And Dave and his wife were moving to an apartment that did not allow cats. And he had this eight-year-old cat that was, they were gonna put in a shelter. And he kept telling me all about what a wonderfully affectionate cat that Lucy was. And so I finally thought, I don't want an eight-year-old cat to end up in a shelter, so we took Lucy. We hadn't had Lucy more than a week when Linda and I kind of confessed to each other that um, Lucy had been biting us. This was a very affectionate cat. 
So by this time, Dave was suddenly gone at another job. Um, I don't know if it was a coincidence or he was just getting out while the getting was good after unloading his cat. But I called up Dave and mentioned that Lucy was biting us and he said, yeah, she can be a real queen bitch. And so I thought, that's funny, she was a very affectionate cat just a couple of weeks ago when uh, you were trying to unload her. But anyway, we love Lucy. And in the last probably six, eight months of her life, she actually did become very affectionate and sat on my lap a lot. And, uh, but even when she was kind of a nasty cat, we liked her a lot because she had a lot of character. So that's the kitties. Oh, I have one more picture, Lucy. She loved to get into things. And uh, you know, you can spend all kinds of money on cats and then what do they do? They play with the bag. So I'm going to read you about a four minute story. <laughs> and this is about um, Franny's first uh, evening with us. And as I was telling you, Franny was this extremely skittish cat. And one day, Linda came back from the chiropractor. And it, this was in February, and it was during a thaw. And that night, it was going to freeze and freeze really hard, and everything was going to get very nasty. But it was kind of a pleasant February day. And Linda was walking, you know, to the front door, and all of a sudden, this black and white cat that wouldn't even stand the look of our faces through the window, uh, according to Linda, ran up to her and started rubbing against her leg and let, her, uh, let Linda pet her. I tried not believing this at all because I was extremely jealous because um, I had fallen in love with Franny uh, just from the seconds of eye contact that uh, I would have with her through the window. So I thought if anyone ought to be rubbed up against it, it was me. And that was because I saw in Franny a cat as neurotic as, as I am. So I felt that I had a bond with her. So that night, I was um, going out to the barn to give treats to our ducks, geese, and hens. And as I was walking back, Franny, this we, she wasn't named at the time, she came running out and did the same thing to me, rubbing up against my leg. So I was even more deeply in love then. <laughs> So this is about Franny's uh, first evening with us. Shortly after dinner, as Agnes waited for my, that's our black hat, Agnes. Shortly after dinner, as Agnes waited for my feet to hit the basement steps, I carried an empty plastic pitcher through the living room and out onto our front porch to refill it from our refrigerator size sack of cat kibbles. The television blaring from the other end of the house warned me about the 80% chance of precipitation supposedly after midnight, but rain had already started to fizz against the sidewalk. How would the white and black cat fare in the downpour, I thought, and then jump back as I noticed her peering in at me, her paws propped against the aluminum door. Sorry, honey, you can't come in, I told her, but I'd already opened the door. She shot onto the porch, but it was obvious she was going through an internal tug of war. Before I could close the door again, she bulleted back outside, then turned to stare up into my eyes with a sweet Sunday school expression. You can stay out if you want to, I told her. She emitted a squeak so high pitched that if I hadn't seen her open mouth, I wouldn't have believed that she'd made it. I held the door for her again, shutting it immediately when she popped inside, only to be chastised with the same plaintive eek. A more patient man might have played Dorsey with her for the rest of the evening, but there was a ceiling in our bedroom that needed staring at. I grabbed a gallon jug of alleged spring water, propped open the door with it, and retreated into the house. The cat hopped out into the downpour, but darted in again by the time I'd returned to the porch with a dollop of budget price canned cat food. I touched her as she gobbled up the fish byproduct and filler. As she raised her back to meet my hand, her whole body trembled. This wasn't the take charge cat that I met in the yard a couple of hours earlier. This was a nervous kitty that felt confined by our porch even though she had a ready exit. I wasn't surprised when she slipped back out into the rain after she had finished eating. But I was floored by what happened next. She popped in again when I presented her with another helping of food, 
and instead of wolfing it down at once, she raised her head and fixed me with a look whose meaning I somehow understood. Despite her deep uneasiness, she wanted me to pet her while she ate. It was almost more than I could stand. Her intensity, her conflict, her fear, her hope, our cat food bills. <laughs> Tears came to my eyes. I was nearly as conflicted as she was about her presence on the porch. It wasn't just a matter of adding another cat to our house. It was my concern about the kind of cat she was. Over the years, most of our cats, birds, and bunnies had been sweet. Others definitely occupied the bitey, noisy, cantankerous, or just plain irritating side of the teeter-totter. But we had never knowingly taken in a difficult animal. We may have been soft-hearted, but we weren't full-blown crazy. And while it may have been written in the stars that some pets would bring us trouble, it hadn't been written in their faces when we first met them, or we would never have brought them home. The white and black cat was different. She was already in our home, and she had already proven that she was difficult by being demonstrably more intelligent than I was. Had I been faced with the magnitude of problems that confronted her, homelessness, hunger, a possible infection or injury, she had a streak on her face, we didn't know what it was, and the imminence of freezing rain, I wouldn't have had the presence of mind to seek out the most logical people who might help. I would have fallen to the ground, tucked my head between my knees, and given up because that's just the kind of man I am. Without the weather radio or the people on television, I never knew when rain was coming. I barely knew day from night. The prospect of having a cat around who would beat me in every battle of wits, including weather prediction, was daunting. But there she was on our porch and off our porch and on our porch again. She tilted her head and her face fleetingly resembled a dozen different animals. A flying fox bat, weasel, bush baby, panther, lemur, spotted gecko, our gang star Carl Alfalfa Switzer, and obscure creatures I didn't recognize. Way in the back of my mind, I saw myself easily transforming her into a fat and lazy pet who would snooze away the afternoon with me. Yeah, right. I didn't know, of course, what a wild ride this wisp of the woods would take us on. By opening the door to her, I had opened our lives to a whole new level of catdom. So that's, that's Franny's story. And now I'm going to tell you a couple stories out of the book after I drink a little water. You can edit out all the water sipping, can you? <laughs> okay, so, um, Two stories about the cats getting the best of us. And the first one is a story, um, it starts being a story about Tina, but it's actually about Franny. And this is about uh, shortly after we took home Tina, we noticed she started getting these spots on her chin, kind of looked like acne. And uh, I even looked on the web and there was such a thing called cat acne. And so we weren't too worried about it, but she started acting like something was wrong with her mouth and we looked inside and she was getting these nasty bumps on her gums. So we immediately took her to the vet and the vet told us that she had a food allergy. So what we had to do was put her on a limited ingredient diet and that was a fancy kibble, unlike the Purina that we had been giving her. This was a fancy kibble that did not have additives like you know sugar and artificial this, artificial that. And also, it had a different protein. It did not have chicken or beef as the protein. I can hardly even tell you what the protein was, so I'll <laughs> show you. As I said, this was expensive food. So we decided that we would simply feed it to Tina rather than feeding it to all our cats and this presented problems because we didn't have a set meal time for our cats. We kept bowls down on the floor all the time. And so starting with this special diet, what we're going to have to do is put Tina in uh, what Linda called her, her office downstairs and put the bowl down, put bowls down for the other cats and this would happen twice a day, they would get their meal time and then all the bowls would get raised up and put away somewhere, and that'd be simple, right? Well, it wasn't so simple. 
Uh, it worked okay for five or six days, but then we started uh, lapsing. We would forget one bowl. And that would undo all our good work because uh, Tina didn't really like this. Uh, it's called duck and pea formula kibble. She didn't really like that, and so she'd make a beeline for whatever bowl of uh, Purina she could find, and she would eat that. So um, the reason it was so difficult for us was because even though we had six cats, we had more than six bowls. That was, uh, for one reason, Agnes uh, lived down the basement a lot, and so he had, she had an extra bowl in the basement. Franny lived in the house by this time, but she also had a bowl on the porch, so that's two extra bowls. Mooby was kind of old, and so uh, by this time a bowl would sort of follow her around the house, just so it would be in ready uh, access to her. So too many bowls, and we'd always forget one. And the other thing is that at this time we had 53 animals, and this was just one thing too many. Okay. So finally we decided that we would just uh, mortgage our house and get this uh, expensive cat food for all the cats. And so that's what we did. We ended up having to buy this, uh, uh, these gold nuggets for all the kitties. So that's the background of this story. And the story is that this is now going back to when there were two feeding times a day. And so one evening, Franny came upstairs while I was working on the computer and she gave me this sort of a look. And then she had me follow her downstairs. And you know it's incumbent upon every cat owner to read your cat's mind. And so I went downstairs and she led me out to the porch and she walked up to the bag of this duck and pea formula kibble, rubbed up against it, and then walked up to her bowl and stared at me. So now she knew that Franny, that Tina was getting something special because um, when I would open the door to uh, put Tina's bowl up, Franny would shoot inside to see what was going on and she knew that uh, Fran, uh, Tina was getting something that she wasn't. So her rubbing up against this bag meant I want some of this. So I took a little handful and just as sort of a garnish sprinkled it on her food. I said, you want your duck food, Franny, and she did. Unfortunately, I did this more than once. I did this two or three times. And once you do anything for a cat two or three times, you are compelled to do it either for the rest of the cat's life or until the day comes when the cat suddenly decides it doesn't want this anymore, it never wanted this, and who do you think you are? <laughs> so everything seemed fairly peaceful after that, uh, after all the cats were eating the, what we called the duck food. And then one evening, Franny came upstairs, gave me that look again, had me follow her downstairs to the porch, and she walked up to the Purina, rubbed up against the Purina, and we'd come full circle. So there I was taking Purina, <laughs> saying, you want your duck food, Franny, and sprinkling that on top of her expensive food. So, I don't know what's more remarkable, the fact that she would want anything that complicated or that I knew what it was that she wanted. So that's just how good cats are at uh, you know, getting what they want out of us. So I'll tell you one more cat story and then I will do a short reading to uh, conclude it. And that story is about Mubi. And Mubi is that white cat with the blue eye and the green eye. Uh, Mubi, we noticed, started licking the top of her leg, or near her shoulder, and we saw that there was a little red dot there. And I took her to Dr. Bennett, the zoo vet in Grand Rapids, great, great vet, and he said that it was a cancer, and also it was malignant, but that it's not the kind of cancer that spreads easily, and so if he just surgically lopped it off, it would be fine as long as she didn't bother it. Well, that's the problem was that immediately after surgery she started licking it again. So we had to get one of those Elizabethan collars for her, those plastic cones. And the day we put it on her, it was the morning before I went to work, it was just miserable because uh, have any of you folks ever had to put one of those on your pet? Yeah, not good is it? 
uh, and she did not do well at all. Um, I didn't even want to go to work, it was so pathetic. Um, I, it was a big struggle to get it on her. I couldn't believe how strong this kind of uh, scrawny 14-year-old cat was. She kept throwing the cone off. And so eventually we got it on her and I put her down on the floor in the living room and it weighted her head down and the lip caught the nap in the rug and she just about did a somersault. <laughs> and she could barely walk. When she was able to walk, and we put her on the linoleum, she couldn't turn a corner without banging her head. And, uh, and I worried about her while I was at work and I came home and it, it looked even worse. Because um, when I came home from work, I found her under a chair, stuck. I thought a lamp had fallen in our dining room because I saw it look like a lampshade. But no, it was, the, it was a poor movie wearing a cone. Uh, going upstairs was a particular problem for her because she would uh, go up to the riser of the chair and her cone would, or the chair, excuse me, of the step and her cone would go against it and kind of plunge her into darkness and she'd have to throw her head up to go to the next step. Um, and you know, cats are very orally centered. If you put your hand in front of your ears, you notice how different everything sounds. And so cats are so used to, if they hear a noise behind them, that ears swivel and they don't have to turn and look, they just know what's going on. But when you got a cone on you, you know, she completely lost the sense of where she was in acoustical space. So it was bad. Well, anyway, this was um, in the winter. Uh, and I had other problems to worry about because we lost electricity and I was outside struggling trying to keep a generator going and I'm not mechanically inclined at all. And by the end of that week, I suddenly realized that not only had Movie gotten used to the cone, but she had mastered it. And that's what I'm gonna read you about. <laughs> she continued to pretend that she couldn't eat from her bowl unless I held it for her. But later I caught her in the hallway doing her walk lid impression. She had been completely encircled her bowl with her cone and then plunged her face into the food, immersing her in a perfect world devoid of sights and sounds as she crunched away on kibble. But as soon as she raised her head and saw me, she banged her cone against the wall as if I were witnessing the tail end of some terrible accident. She meowed urgently, requesting me to hold her dish. Mubi hadn't merely adapted to her collar. She had turned it into an advantage over the coneless beings around her. <laughs> Lucy and Agnes were intimidated by the cat-like creature with the weird headgear and gave way whenever she approached, which led to a proportionate increase in boldness on her part. She invaded their territory, taking over a choice sleeping spot on the arm of the couch or sashaying up to me, demanding to be the center of attention while I was petting one of them. And while she feigned helplessness at her own dish, she blatantly wielded her cone as a shield while she crunched and slurped their food. <laughs> a few days later, we were awakened by a sharp rapping at the bedroom door. Now we were used to Mubi at some ungodly hour in the morning, like 5.30, she didn't have any claw, she would come up and start pounding on the door just for us to get up. I don't even know why she wanted us up. You know, cats are like that. So a few days later, we were awakened by a sharp rapping at the bedroom door. What in heaven's name is that, Linda asked as we sat up in bed. My first thought was that someone had broken into the house, either a burglar or a woodpecker. <laughs> then we heard it again and identified the source. Instead of raking the door with her paws to rouse us, Mubi was using the lip of the plastic cone to bang against the wood. Linda sleepily let her in, and she bounded up onto the mattress toward my pillow, planting her feet on my chest and thrusting her face into mine. Linda snapped on the light. Inches away from my head, a bright white kitty face swam against a white plastic background a feline sun burning brightly in a terrible cosmic void. The countenance of a fussy cat goddess commanding tribute from her human subjects. I threw off the cover, shrinking back, fearful that I would tumble body and soul into a maw of bottomless desire. 
She actually likes it, I told Linda with a shiver, as we sat on the edge of the bed sipping coffee a few minutes later. I clutched my beloved songbird mug in my hand, but it gave me little comfort as Mubi shop shot laser-sharp begging looks at me. I had already given her food once and water twice. She was probably holding out for bacon. She knows that as long as she's wearing that cone, she's going to be spoiled, I said. Howard the dove hooted and cooed from the dining room. The parrots traded morning vocalizations, with Bella struggling to whistle the Andy Griffith Show theme song, and Dusty asking, what does the duck say? Theirs was a relaxed and innocent world that suddenly seemed far, far away. It isn't an Elizabethan collar, I said, not to her. I held my palm in front of Mooby's face, trying to thwart her stare, but she moved two steps, sat down again, and continued to pummel me with her high beams. It's her funnel of happiness, I said. <laughs> so those are my kitty stories. Um, I should mention this is from a chapter called The Funnel of Happiness, and this book was originally called The Funnel of Happiness. And at the very last minute, uh, my publisher decided that uh, they didn't like the title. They liked it, but they thought it was too obscure, and even showing a cat with a cone, it was going to be too hard to um, explain to anybody, especially they kept trying to come up with a subtitle that had a cone in it, and it was just, they, they couldn't do it, and I couldn't do it either. So I was really irritated and sort of panicky because they wanted another title. On. I, I had worked on this book for four years. You read this book, you wonder how it could have taken me more than 10 minutes. But um, <laughs> you know, it took me four years. The book was substantially different, actually. When I, believe it or not, when this book started, it wasn't much about the cats. They don't even ask. But um, so I'd worked on it under the title of uh, Funnel of Happiness for at least three of the four years and I didn't know what to do, and uh, kept thinking of bad, one bad name after another. And then uh, one night Linda uh, took a bath and walked in the other room, and she said, while I was sitting in the bathtub, I thought of Kitty Cornered. And I thought, that's a great title, and so that's how, that's how we got the, the name. So I think it's a pretty good name. So I think that's worked all right.